good word. What a solid word. My goodness. I'm going to praise him in spite of everything. You know that phrase, I'm going to dance in the rain? That's just such a good description of trusting God, isn't it, really? <laughs> when it's raining, just get out there and dance in the rain. That says it all, I'll guarantee you. We've been in a series for about five or six weeks, six weeks now, on, um, on unmasking the enemy. And the purpose of that is that we would know our enemy. If you know his name, he's given many names. 30, I think I got up to 38 by count in the Bible. And there may be more, you know, as I read and I find one that I didn't see before, I'll mark it and add it to my list. About 38 I've come to so far that are either direct names or descriptive, um, descriptive uh, adjectives about him that describe him. Like the roaring lion is, is one that would be that way. That's, that's how he is. That's the way he acts. Well, the premise is, and, and I don't know how it's working for you or, or how it will in the days to come work for you, but our enemy has just multiple facets. And the only thing that stays consistent about him is that everything he says is a lie. He cannot tell the truth. He cannot know the truth. The scripture says he is a liar and there is no truth in him. And there cannot be for he is a liar and the father of lies. So everything he says, no matter how um, logical, reasonable, uh, emotional, uh, soothing it might be, just remember that he's an enemy that lies and he'll deceive you in every imaginable way and it's all gonna lead to your destruction. That's what he's after. He's, his purpose is to devour you, to devour your family, to devour your children, to devour your finances, your business, your peace, your, your security. I mean, that's what he's after. And so I wanted to preach one more message in, in this series um, in connection with this. And, and I know you guys might be getting tired of you know bat, battle messages and so forth, but I did want to do one, just one more because I think the, the truths of this word that I'm about to speak to you will really help you. My only purpose as a pastor is to, is to help my flock, yeah, uh, yeah. To, to help you see, to help you be prepared, to help you be safe and live in safety and to know what to do when an enemy attacks, what they look like, what they sound like, how they act, so you won't be caught off guard and be devoured. Yeah. I mean, I think that's really my responsibility. That's what God called me to. That's why God calls pastors, shepherds of flocks. And I, 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 in your outline, I, I had some outlines like we do every Sunday out there, and <clears throat> I always write an opening paragraph to kind of give you an idea of what the whole gist of the thing is about. And I'm gonna just read this one today to start the message, all right? I'm, I'm just gonna use this and, and, just, and just read exactly what I wrote. And so if you're, you're following along there, you have it. Satan is the most cruel being in the universe. When you think of the cruelest person that has ever lived, you probably roll across names like Genghis Khan, Attila the Hun, Caligula, for you, you Roman people, Bloody Mary, Hitler, Stalin, Idi Amin Dada, which is the butcher of Uganda. People like Stalin, Hitler, Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden can't be forgotten, Abu Bakr Baghdadi, and Abu Masad Zarqawi, or maybe even Qasem Soleimani. When evil is present, Satan is always behind that evil. The devil is so cruel and vicious that your agony actually brings him joy. When you are at your most vulnerable, he is at his worst. When you are ready, already devastated, you might think that he would just leave you alone. You know, let you go through what you're going through without further affliction. He could take a few days off every now and then, don't you think? He does not do this. The enemy has no mercy. When you are down, he pours it on. 
He attacks you with all types of accusations. You should have done things differently. You should have said something different. You should have taken more time. You should have, did, uh, should have had a, done a better job in, in all such statements. This message is about what to do when the enemy attacks you. How do you win this battle? I'm gonna be using today Psalm 42 and Psalm 43. I know that many of you that have been in the scripture a lot in your life are aware that uh, when, the, when the scriptures were originally written, they were written over a period of thousands of years, by the way, by 40 different authors who didn't even know each other for the most part and didn't know the other had written anything. And all of the chapters and the verse numbers and all of that were put in there by translators so that you could have reading and people could turn to the same location and it would be identifiable and so forth. To make it easier to, to share uh, publicly is basically what it boils down to. So Psalm 42 and Psalm 43, I believe, were written at the same time. I believe they're the same psalm. I believe they were written as one psalm by, by David. And then the translators just divided them up a little bit, and there are several internal reasons for that that I won't bore you with. But, but anyway, David wrote this psalm while he was on the run from his own son, Absalom. And you remember the story of Absalom. He's David's son, and David was a wonderful champion in many things and in many ways, a tremendous man of God in many ways, but he wasn't a parent, and, and his parenting skills were very poor. And, he had, and his children had trouble all of their lives. And Absalom is one that uh, took matters into his own hand by killing his brother Amnon because Amnon raped his own sister Tamar, and dad did nothing about it. For two years, David sat in the palace, never met with Absalom, never met with anybody, never, never adjudicated anything about what's going to happen to Amnon and so forth. Finally, after two years, Absalom takes matters into his own hand and he kills Amnon. Well, he flees to another city and for three years, Absalom stays in that city. No word from David, no, no officers come, no charges come. No uh, search for him, no come back home, let's talk about this, let's, it's our family, come on. For three years, we are now five years into this event and nothing has happened. And finally, David, uh, well, one of David's men actually tricked Absalom into coming back to the kingdom and he comes back to the kingdom and he's there for two more years. David never sends for him, David never meets with him, David never does anything to address any of the issues that are going on at all. And now we are seven years into the catastrophe with nothing being done. Absalom finally snaps and he begins to undermine his own father and begins to take away David's kingdom. And he begins to hunt David. He's gonna kill him. If David, David has to run for his life, he's being pursued by an adversary, by an enemy. This enemy is constantly on his heels day and night. Remember, this is an enemy that knows everything about him and knows everywhere he might go and, might, and, and would pursue him in places that other enemies may not even think to look. And while David is being chased by an enemy, his own son, Absalom. David writes this psalm that we're about to, to look at for some direction. And the very first verse of this psalm is this. Psalm 42, one. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. Now, some of you older folks might remember a little tune that went, went like that from the 80s. And Tanya said, don't sing it, but I am. She said, they won't even know what you're talking about. It went like, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after you. You, O oh God, are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. That comes from that very verse right there. But what does it mean? 
it's very poetic and it's very beautiful sounding as the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, Lord. But what does that mean? Well, David is writing this psalm when he is under attack. Now, I know because I shared with you a lot of information about lions and stuff like that, wild animals and so forth. You think I, I do nothing but sit around and watch National Geographic and Animal Planet and all that kind of stuff. Well, I am pretty interested in all those kind of things. But I got really interested in it because this verse says that like a deer pants for the water brooks, a water brook is a small stream, fast running stream. I mean, a, a nice tranquil place. That's what a water brook is, a brook of water. And, and the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you. What could that mean? And so I started studying deer just a little bit. Now, I'm not a deer hunter like Brian and, and Billy, all of you guys. I mean, you guys, uh, Danny, I know you guys are, Mitch, you ever hunt? Uh, yeah, Y'all ever, anybody? Anyway, you guys that hunt deer, you probably know way more, but but you can find out anything on the internet. I'm telling you that. <laughs> you can study anything on the internet. And I studied deer. Now, and I'm talking about any deer type animal, like a gazelle or an antelope or anything that is in that basic family, you know, an elk, uh, those kind of things. I found out, what I found out is that there is only one time that a deer actually pants. That a deer is not like a dog. You know, you have a, a dog at home and, and, and they get hot. And then they, they start, you know, panting like that. And they, they say that that's a form of cooling themselves down. Well, you'll never find a deer just walking up in your yard and going, <laughs> because he doesn't pant like that. There's only one time that a deer pants. And that's when he is being pursued by an enemy. When a deer's being pursued by an enemy, he might use up to 80% of his water reserves. What that means is if you chase him long enough and hard enough, he'll die. And the very first thing that happens when he eludes his enemy that's pursuing him is he heads for the water because he's got to replenish the, all of that water that he's lost while he's been pursued, while he's been in pursuit. And so the first thing, I mean, how many of you've watched uh, programs about the African grasslands and you see a, a pride of lions hunting gazelle or antelope or these springbok or any of these gazelle-like animals? How many of, I'm just saying, this is just my personal, for me personally, how many of you like it when the, when the antelope gets away? Raise your hand. All right, the rest of you are sickos. <laughs> But the first thing that happens when that antelope gets away is he heads for water because he has to replenish everything that he lost while he was being pursued by an enemy. And so in this psalm, David is saying, I'm being chased by an enemy. And he's saying, my soul is tired of running. My soul is panting. And I'm panting for you, Lord. And you are the only one that can refresh my soul. You are the only thing that can replenish me. God is your water. And when you need to be refreshed, David says, God is the only refresher of your soul that is available. And when the enemy is after you, you run for God like a deer runs for the water brook and pants after God because God is the only one that can help. Now, let me give you four things to do when you're under attack. Four real, really simple things. If I use the word oxymoron, do you know what I'm talking about? Conflicting things, you know, like it's real, but it's a lie. You know, a real lie, that would be an oxymoron, you know, that kind of thing. You know, government intelligence, oh, never mind, I'm, I'm just... <laughs> Forget I said that. Bad preacher. All right, here's number one. What do you do when you're under attack? Number one, you must recognize that you are in a battle. Now, I know this sounds redundant to say this, but there are many people who do not recognize the fact that they are in a spiritual battle. There are many people who think, well, I'm having a down day, or 
I'm dealing with some uh, unfavorable emotions. Uh, I might need to take a Xanax or something. I mean, I, I got a lot of anxiety going up in here. I, got, I mean, when, when, when these kind of things begin happening, their first response is to think, something's wrong with me. I'm telling you the first reaction that you should have is, I am in a battle. This is a battle that I'm in. I'm not just having a bad day. I am in a battle. Look at verse three of Psalm 42. My tears have been my food day and night. This is David writing. While they, you see it? While they continually say to me, where is your God? First thing I would ask is, who is they? Have any of you, you know, I've heard of they all my life. Have you? Who is they? Have y'all ever met they? They is a very elusive creature, right? Where did you hear that? They said it. Or a phrase like, they don't make things like they used to, do they? Who is they? Well, David is gonna tell us in verses nine and 10 who they is. In verse nine and 10, I will say to God my rock, David says, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? They is your enemy. And that is exactly what the enemy does. Where is your God? David had his physical enemies. Absalom's chasing him. They're pursuing him to physically kill him. Now, even though you and I, hopefully, don't have any physical enemies that are pursuing us to kill us physically, we certainly do have spiritual enemies. And you know what our spiritual enemy is saying to us? Where is your God? We have an enemy, the name Diablos means slanderer and accuser. We have, an, we have an enemy that slanders and accuses God to us all day and all night if he possibly can. Look at, look, look at what you're going through, he says. Where's God? You've served him all of your life. And just when you need him, where is he? Why didn't your mother get healed? Why didn't he save your marriage? Why did you go broke? Why did you lose your job? Seems like God could have helped you in some way. You've been serving him all of your life and now you're getting ripped off and all I want to ask is, where is God? The voice of the enemy. This is what the devil does. This is the battle that you are in. A real spiritual battle. This is not imaginary, guys. This is the real thing. Yeah, yeah. Now, I want to teach you a phrase to use when you realize you're in a battle. And here's the phrase. It comes from Zechariah 3. Let me set it up a second. This is Zechariah 3, verse 2. Joshua the, pro Joshua the high priest, not Joshua that led the children of Israel into the promised land. There are two Joshuas. Joshua the high priest and Zechariah 3 is standing with someone that he calls the angel, capital A, angel of the Lord. And everybody say Jesus. Jesus. That's who he's with. He's standing there with Jesus. Yeah, capital A. So Jesus is standing there and Joshua the high priest is standing there. And it says, and on the right hand side of Jesus is standing the accuser who opposes Christ and he's arguing with us, Joshua says. And the Lord turns to him and says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. It's a good phrase. And then in Jude 9, Jude is the half-brother of James, or is the brother of James, and Jude's little book in the New Testament right before Revelation has only one chapter. And the whole book is about contending for the faith. And Jude says, along around verse nine or so, Jude says, and Michael the archangel, when he was contending with the devil for the body of Moses, 
did not argue with the devil. He just looked at the devil and said, the Lord rebuke you. So I'm telling you, here's a phrase. When you realize that an enemy is attacking you, he's attacking your mind, he's attacking your emotions, he's attacking your will, he's trying to manipulate you and shove you down and depress you and abuse you, you must learn what weapons you have and how to use the weapons that God has given you. And this weapon is, when, you, when that happens, you look at the devil and you say, the Lord rebuke you. And if he's Satan, he's opposing you. He's an adversary. If it's the devil, he's accusing you and slandering you. If it's Lucifer, it's pride involved in something that's going on right there. If it's the roaring lion, is he's trying to intimidate you. He's trying to make, I mean, if you can remember him specifically, the Lord rebuke you, devil. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord rebuke you, Lucifer. This is why we learn things like this. Because it matters in the spiritual realm. And, 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 and so that's a weapon. Now, when you're in a battle, you realize you're in a battle, there are, there are two things you need to recognize. Number one, it's real. You are in a real battle. This is not an imaginary thing. It's not just your feelings. It's not just your emotions. You're not just having a bad day. It's not just some disturbing things have been brought up. It is a battle and it is real. Now here comes the oxymoron. Second thing you must recognize is it's a lie. I just told you it's real, now I'm telling you it's a lie. It's a real lie. What, <laughs> what I'm saying to you is that Satan works in the same way every time. And, and, and this is the way. Remember, that he is a liar, and he is the father of lies, and he cannot tell the truth. So when you get down and you get under attack, he is going to use that opportunity to lie to you. And he's going to say things like this. You know you can't make it through this because you messed up. How many times have you messed up? You, how many times have you told God that you'd never do this kind of thing again? You, a hundred times? And here you are back in the same mess. How many times you said you'd never do this? You know, you, you, you're never going to, it's never going to work out for you. You are worse than ever. You are the weakest, uh, sorriest excuse for a Christian that I've ever seen in my life. And don't expect God to do anything to help you in your life. That's the voice of Satan. And when you hear that, say, the Lord rebuke you and all the lies that you're telling me. What I want you to see is you are not in a depression. You are not in an anxiety attack. You are not in a psychosis. You are in a spiritual battle. Now, look, let me just say this and listen. I'm not saying that there's no such thing as clinical depression or anxiety that doesn't need medicine or something like that. So don't, don't go away and say, Pastor Keith said, depression is just a spiritual battle. We don't need any medicine. We, yeah, some of you do. Well, let's just put, let's don't make it some of you. <laughs> some people do need medicine, <laughs> you know, and, and they need to take it regular too. Because sometimes, I mean, these can be physical things. They can be biological. But, but what I'm saying is, look, don't jump to the immediate conclusion that I'm, I need some medicine for this stuff. I mean, don't let that be your first thought when this something hits you like this. When it hits you, think, man, this is an enemy. He's come to take advantage of me. And I, the Lord rebuke you. I mean, that's a stance of the spirit right there. Now, I'm going to tell you what. You're facing an expert liar, and don't forget about it. And, and let me just show you just how good a liar Satan is. Satan is such a good liar that he will produce evidence to back up his lie. Now, it's going to be false evidence, but it's going to seem real. I've got a little acrostic in your study outline, if you, if you noticed it, uh, for the word fear, it's false evidence appearing real. When Satan gives you false evidence that appears real, he's trying, to, he's trying to create fear in you. And he is an expert at it. And let me just show you what I mean. In Genesis chapter 37, you have the story of Joseph. 
You know, he's the, he's the, son, he's the 11th son of Jacob, and Jacob loves him more than all the rest of his brothers, and Jacob gives him the coat of many colors. Do you remember the story? And, and, jo and Joseph is a little old boy, and his brothers are out doing some work on the farm or wherever they might be, and, and Jacob says to little Joseph, who's the baby of the family right now, he'll have a brother later named Benjamin, but right now he's the baby of the family. And, he, and, and Jacob says, uh, son, go out and see how your brothers are doing. Let's see, do they need some water or, or you know, what can, is there something we can do to help? He says, go out there and check on them. And Joseph goes out there to check on them. And as the brothers see Joseph approaching, the brothers say, let's kill that little sucker. He ain't nothing but trouble. He had those dreams. We ain't bowing down to him. We're not going to worship him. He's not going to be ahead of us. What a smart addict little punk. Let's kill him. And finally, one of the brothers says, no, I, I tell you what, let's don't kill him. Let's just throw him down in this pit right here. And, um, and we'll just, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll tell dad that a wild animal killed him, you know, something. And then about that time, the Midianites were coming down a little sale trade route. They said, let's sell him to the Midianites. So that's what they did. But they took his coat off of him, the coat of many colors that dad gave him to show how much he loved him. And they dipped it in, they tore it. They tore it like it had been ripped. And they dipped it in, in goat's blood. And they took it back home to dad. And when they got back home to dad, dad said, where's Joseph? And the boy said, dad, is, is this Joseph's coat? Crafty. Is this Joseph's coat? And when dad saw that bloody coat of many colors that had been ripped, dad jumps to the conclusion he must have been killed by a wild animal. Now, was that the truth? Negatory. That was not the truth. That was a lie. But you had the evidence. And I'll guarantee you that Jacob kept that little coat in a very special place and every once in a while he would pull it out and mourn over the loss of his son. That's how good Satan is. He even produces evidence to back up his lies to convince you that his lies are true. So number one, when you are in a battle, realize that you are in a battle and realize that it's real and that Satan is going to lie to you in this battle. All right, the second thing you must do when you are in a battle, you must stop listening to yourself. When you get in a battle, stop listening to yourself. It's gonna be a problem, believe me. Psalm 42, verse four, next verse, look at it. When I rem look, this is David. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. He's saying, when I think about these things that I'm about to tell you, I just, I just pour out my soul to myself. You know, I just, I just get all torn up about these things. I just pour it all out on myself. For, and here's what I say. For, for I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God. And I had a voice and joy and praise. I remember that. And, and, and I went with the multitude that kept a pilgrim feast. Do you see what he's doing? He is just reminiscing about what used to be. And he's just wallowing in it. I used to be able to go with the people of God. I used to be joy and happiness. I used to be filled with life. I used to praise. I used... That's what he's saying to himself. That's what his soul is pouring out to himself. Listen, when you are depressed, don't try to cheer yourself up. All that is is a depressed person trying to cheer up a depressed person, and that's never going to work. If you are depressed, you need to get something that will encourage you. You're not going to encourage yourself, I can guarantee you that. 
You need to get the Word of God. That'd be a good thing. Open up the Word of God and let God, let the Holy Spirit enlighten you on something God said that might lift you out of that, that, those doldrums that you're in. Or get you a playlist that has praise and worship. I mean, when you're happy, when everything's going good and you're excited, create a playlist so that one day when things are bad, you can just pop on that playlist and it'll start praise, singing praise and worship and it'll lift your spirits and God can speak to you and the Holy Spirit can exalt himself in your life. And, 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 or get around somebody that is a friend that encourages you, that says positive things, that, that has a positive kind of vibe going on in life. I'm just encouraging you that, that, that what you do when the enemy is attacking you is that you attack back. When the enemy's trying to discourage you and depress you, don't just sit there and take it. I mean, attack back. <laughs> God's given you weapons to attack. And quit listening to yourself. You're depressing yourself. Number three thing you must do, you must start talking to yourself. All right, now that's an oxymoron, right? <laughs> I said, just told you stop listening to yourself. Now I'm telling you start, start talking to yourself. What I mean by that is, I know you're saying, well, if I start talking to myself, they'll take me away. <laughs> well, I can testify that's not the truth. I talk to myself all the time. <laughs> Don't I tell you? <laughs> Anybody that's ever worked with me, say, uh, every once in a while they say, Keith, are you talking to me? No, I'm talking to myself. Uh, sorry, dog. Out loud, I answer. I even answer myself. Yeah, I'm bad. <laughs> but anyway, I, what I'm talking about is start talking to yourself in the, in the right way is what I'm trying to identify here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, here. Here's what I mean. All right, David has just finished saying in verse four that we just read, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me. All right, your soul. What is your soul? All right, say this with me. I am a spirit. I have a soul. And I live in a body. That's you. That's all of us. We are triune beings. Just like God is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Everything God creates is triune, has three parts. You are a spirit because God blew his breath. When God created man, he took the dust to the ground, formed a man, blew, whew, his, blew his breath into us. That breath was not intended to inflate our lungs so that we could start breathing air. That is God's spirit he blew into us. That is the essence of God that he blew into us. And it says, and man became a living soul. That's part of God. Now, God did not create women out of the dust of the ground, by the way, men. I know you're aware of this. He created women out of your rib, right? Which means from the very beginning, women were much more expensive and far more complicated than men. <laughs> just, that, that's just extra. That's just thrown in extra for you. Yeah, you know, move on. <laughs> so anyway, because there's part of God in us, there's a part of us that will never die. That is our spirit. Our spirit will never die. It will go into eternity somewhere. That's what goes to heaven or goes to hell. That's the choice you make. That's God. That's part of God, and it's never going to die. And that is your spirit. You are the real you is a spirit. You have a soul. The word soul comes from the word psyche, which means self. The soul is the seat of your will, it's the seat of your thoughts, it's the seat of your emotions, it's the seat of your personality, your temperament, your likes and dislikes. All of that happens in your soul. You are listening to me with your soul right now. You're making decisions with your soul. At the end of this message, it will be your soul that makes a choice. And of course, my body is the house I live in on this earth until God's through with me on this earth and then I leave this old house behind and I get a new house when I get to heaven, thank the Lord. This one is already worn out, I can tell you that right now. So what is, what is he talking about? What, I pour out my, my soul all right, 
What is it in this battle that you are having problems with? You're having problems with your thoughts and your emotions, right? It's your thoughts and your emotion where the battle is raging. But your thoughts and your emotions now are affecting your choice and your decision. So your thoughts and your emotions are affecting the way you think and the way you reconcile things. So here's what I'm saying. I hope this is not too double jointed. Stop listening to the soul part of you your thoughts and your emotions. When you are in a battle, stop listening to your soul that will be emotional and irrational and start speaking to the soul part of you. Let your spirit speak to the soul part of you. Quit listening to your soul make you emotional and confuse you and let your spirit start speaking to your soul and tell your soul what that soul needs to do. Look at the next verse, verse five. Look, why are you cast down? The word cast down means depressed. I don't know why this is true. It seems to be exactly backward, but you can look it up in the dictionary. When you depress something, it means you push it down. Like in an automobile, if you depress the brake, it means push the brake down. It sounds like it ought to be just the opposite. When you depress the accelerator, it means push the accelerator down. So David is saying, soul, why are you pressed down? What, what is pressing you down? What is causing you to be pressed down? See, when you're depressed, you're pressed down. Some, something is pressing you down. And what I'm saying is, it, you need to find out what it is. Is it the enemy? Is it the enemy that's pressing you down? David said, why are you depressed, O oh my soul? And why are you disquieted? Now, disquieted means <laughs> not quiet. It means noisy. It actually literally means to growl or to roar. So David is saying, so why are you pressed down? And why are you so noisy? Why are you roaring? Why are you, why are you growling? And, and you're making noise and you won't be quiet and you're just, you're just upsetting and disturbing everything. So what is going on with you? And then he starts talking to himself, trying to cheer himself up, and look at what he says. Hope in God. <laughs> you old noisy, roaring soul and depressed soul. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Yeah, the enemy is pushing you down. The enemy's causing you to roar. Now, in connection... Now follow this, don't fade on me now. In connection with this concept of my soul being able to roar and growl and not be quiet and my soul to be able to be pushed down and depressed, David writes in another Psalm, Psalm 131, about his soul being weaned like a child is weaned off the bottle. Look at, look at it. Psalm 131, verse two. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. Okay. What do you do when you wean a child? You take the bottle away from him that's full of milk and you start getting him on some solid food, right? That's what weaning him means. All right. Does he take this well? Not at first, right? For sure. Not at first. At first, when you start trying to take that milk away from him, that bottle away from him, what's that baby going to do? That baby's going to, he's going to cry. He's going to throw a fit. He's going to have a temper tantrum. 
Man, he's going to be just wound up and just wide open. Now, that's what your soul does when you are in a battle. Your soul that's ruled by emotions and all, your, your soul starts throwing a fit. It, it goes crazy. Why is this happening? What is this? I'm crazy. What am I going mad? I, I don't know what to do. What, why are they saying that about me? I mean, your soul just starts having a fit. Just like a baby that's trying to be weaned off of a bottle. And, and let me show you what, what that means. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says to the 1 Corinthians, by now you should be eating meat. But I'm not able to feed you meat because now you're still sucking on a bottle. Because you're still babies. You know why? You know why they were still immature? Because they were soulish people. They were people that were being ruled by their souls. And your soul wants what it wants when it wants it. And it will do whatever it wants and you ain't telling it what to do. Let me, let me talk to you just a second about your soul and your spirit. When you are conceived in your mother's womb, your soul comes alive. Now listen to me. You're going to think, you say, oh, pastor, you, you're kind of speaking crazy. All right, listen to what I'm saying. When you are conceived in your mother's womb, you became, you become a living soul. A soul. You have a temperament. You have a personality. You have stuff you like and don't like. And you mamas know, if you've, especially if you've had more than one baby, you know, man, they, they may act totally different, even in the womb. Some of them are active, and some of them are quiet, and some of them don't like spinach, and some of them don't like broccoli, and some of them like, uh, like you know, when you eat something, they say, get that out of here, you know. And you get all sick and heartburn and everything. I mean, even in the womb, a child has a personality. And especially when they come out and they're like a year old or something like that, you, you can easily tell the personality, the temperament, the nature of that child. You can tell what they like and what they don't like, whether they're active or calm. I mean, there are lots, and, and, and the more children you have, the more you notice how different they are. They have their own natures, their own personality. Tanya used to keep Jacks when he was about one year old, too, and... Um, and it was funny because it had been a long time since we had a little, little one in our home, that, that small. And it was funny because when he got able to toddle around and do stuff, he had like a bunch of toys over here. And he would get, what he would do is he would get toys that are alike, like cars or, you know, boats or people, whatever it might be, or things that are the same color, like blue, red, whatever. And he would arrange them. He would arrange them, you know, on the little table there and put, them, put all the stuff together that, that were grouped like he thought it ought to be grouped. And then you could, take, you could take and move one of them. And as soon as he noticed it, he'd come back over there and put it right back where it was. That was his personality. He's two years old. That's his personality. Well, what I'm saying about the soul and the spirit is when I am conceived in my mother's womb, my soul comes alive. Okay, my soul has been alive since I was conceived. I was conceived somewhere in, Ju in July of 1955. I was born in March of 1956. My soul was alive. My soul has been alive now for all of these years. But my spirit did not come alive. It was there but it wasn't alive until I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life and to be my Lord and I wave the white flag. It means I'm getting my soul off of the throne. I'm deposing my soul and I'm asking Jesus to sit on the throne of my life. My spirit comes alive. Let me show you. This is in Ephesians 2. It's just a couple of verses. So, all right, hang on. And you, he made alive. All right, why did he have to make you alive? Because you weren't alive, right? 
He made you alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. That means the reason you were dead, your spirit was dead, is because you lived in trespasses and sins. That was you, and you were dead, and he made you alive in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince, the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So you were dead because you're, you were a sinner, and you had never asked Christ to come in and change your life, but when you did, then he made you alive. Now, I'm, I'm going somewhere now with this, all right? All right. My soul was alive when I was conceived. I came, I came to Jesus Christ when I was 16 years old. So for 16 years, my soul had been in charge of my life. For 16 years, my selfishness, my self, my soul was telling me what I could do and what I couldn't do. I could say what I wanted to say. I could go where I wanted to go. I could do what I wanted to do. I could respond any way I wanted to respond because my soul just was totally in charge and I was totally selfish because a soulish person is a selfish person. And when I turned 16 years old and at an altar, I got on my knees and I said, Jesus Christ, come into my life and save my soul. I'm waving the white flag. Jesus, I need you. I surrender. Come and change my life right now. I'm opening the door of my heart. And when I did that, my spirit came alive. And my spirit looked at my soul and said, we're not going to do this anymore. You, you, know, you can't say that. that. That's not good. You can't say stuff like that. You, you, gotta, you, you can't disobey authority now. You got to obey. There's an authority in life. You can't treat people that way. You can't say stuff to them. You can't, you can't be vindictive and hateful because that's not like Jesus. And my soul, being the wonderful, sweet person that he is, said, okay. Now, if you believe that, I got a bridge in Arizona to sell you. No, you, what, did, what did my soul do? My soul had a fit. My soul threw a temper tantrum. My soul said, you ain't telling me what to do. I've been in charge around here for all of this time, and, 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 and I'm going to do what I want to do just like I've always done it. My soul started growling. My soul started howling. My soul started being disquieted. I'm doing my own thing. Now, this is a principle. Let me show you the principle. The principle is the older being subject or submitted to the younger. The soul being the older, because he's been alive a lot longer. The spirit being the younger, because he's been alive a lot shorter time. The principle in the Bible is that the older will serve the younger. You know, we'll show it in Scripture, Genesis 25. In Genesis 25, and the Lord said to her, who is her? She's Rebecca. She's Isaac's wife. She's going to have two boys, Esau and Jacob. They're twins. They're fighting in the womb. Look at what God says. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. That's a principle of God. Rachel and Leah was the same way. You remember, Jacob worked for beautiful Rachel. Rachel was the youngest daughter of Laban. Jacob said, what do I need to do? Laban said, work seven years and you can have her. And then on the wedding night, he took the oldest daughter, Leah, and substituted her for Rachel. And when Jacob woke up in the morning, the Bible says, and behold, it was Leah. I mean, like, oh, my Lord, what in the world? And Laban said, hey, you're going to have to work seven more years and you get beautiful Rachel. Well, Rachel was the love of his life. She was the younger. Leah was the older. All of their life, the older served the younger. Same thing was true about, about, uh, about David and his brothers. David was the youngest brother. There were seven brothers older than him. But David was the one that God chose 
The same thing with, with, with Isaac and Ishmael. You remember Sarah and Abraham and, and, and Hagar tried to uh, get uh, Abraham a son that God had promised, and, they, and, and, and Hagar had Ishmael. And then God said, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not blessing through Ishmael. Uh, and Sarah got pregnant, and she had a boy named Isaac. Isaac was the youngest. Ishmael was the oldest. But, uh, but the earth was blessed through Isaac and not through Ishmael. The older served the younger. Joseph and his brothers. He was the youngest brother and all the other brothers were older and they had to bow down to him. Even in the New Testament, the prodigal son and the prodigal son's older brother. That older brother never left home. The younger brother's the one who got the money and went away. But when he came back, the younger brother was, uh, was, was saved and, 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 and filled and, and became the leader of the family. And the older brother sitting out there with his lip poked out on the porch wanting him to go into the party. What is that? That is the principle of the older serving the younger, and it's a spiritual principle that is talking about the fact that your spirit has been ordained by God to rule over your soul. And that's what Dave is talking about here. He said, when you get all shook up in battle, your spirit needs to look at your soul and say, sit down and be quiet. David said, whenever you, things get all out of shape, look at your soul, let your spirit speak to your soul and say, we're not doing that anymore. Sit down over there. I don't want to hear another word out of you. And the soul is subject to the spirit. All right, so quit listening to yourself and start talking to yourself. Here's the fourth one. I'm going to do it quickly. I can see y'all about to pass out. Number four, quickly go to God. When you find yourself in a battle, quickly, that's the operative word, <laughs> quickly go to God. When you are under attack, you run to God like a deer runs for the water after the chase is over. All right, we're going to look at Psalm 42 and Psalm 43, and I'm going to read you three verses. And they're going to sound like the same thing, but just listen to them, all right? These are three verses out of Psalm 42 and 43. Verse 5, Psalm 42, verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Now, verse 11, Psalm 42, verse 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Psalm 43, verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Now, those three verses sound exactly alike, but they are not. And I put, the next, did you put this next slide up there? I underlined, I put the part that's different and I underlined it so you can see the difference. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. And the other two verses says, the help of my countenance and my God. Here's what David is actually saying. When I look at his face, it changes my face. If I look at his countenance, it changes my countenance. When you are disturbed about something, when you are under the stress of a battle of any kind, physical, spiritual, emotional, people around you are going to see it and they're going to know it. Where are they going to see it? They're going to see it on your face, on your countenance. No matter how you try to hide it, no matter how much you try not to move your face, the, no matter how much you try to have nothing about your countenance that reflects any distress in your life, they are going to see it, especially if they know you. 
I can't tell you, at times I've had some very stressful, terrible times. And I remember one specifically, and I happened to stop at Amy's house first because she was the first one, and I needed to tell her something because it was effective her immediately. And I went to the door, and, and I mean, I'm, I'm not crying, I'm not uh, shaking, I'm not anything, I'm not breathing hard. I think I'm perfectly calm, collected, cool, and everything. And I knock on the door, and she opens the door, and she says, hey, Dad, what's wrong? I mean, she didn't even get Dad out before she said, what's wrong? Tanya does it all the time. What's, what's wrong? Is something wrong? Because of some countenance that's going on. Look, I'm not trying to criticize you for having a, 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 a stressful look on your face when you're in stress. That's normal. That's natural to do that. And I'm not trying to criticize you for, for having some emotions when things are tough. I, I'm really not. That's just as natural. And I, that's, we all do that. That's human. That's humanity. I'm just saying, what I am saying is that when Satan uses that opportunity to attack you, when you're under stress and, emo and he's trying to take advantage of you and attack you, I'm just saying uh, you attack him back. That's all I'm saying. And the best way to attack him is for you to get with God. Let me give you this one little thing and I am through. Mm -hmm, that's right. All right, do you know what David was sad about in this psalm? What really shook him up more than anything? Well, it's a phrase that he uses in there. He said, I used to go with the multitude to the house of God. David said, when my soul began to pour out, here's what I said, I used to go to the house of God with all my friends. Now, he's losing his throne. He's losing his family. He's, lo he's losing the purpose of being the king uh, uh, of the kingdom that God has called him to. But do you know what, what he's most sad about? He's most sad about the fact that he's losing his church. He's losing the privilege of going into the temple so that he can meet with the people of God at the house of God and meet with God. That's what he's most upset about. But somewhere on the journey between Psalm 42 and Psalm 43, somewhere right in there, David has a revelation. And the revelation is, you know, I am a man after God's own heart. And do you know why David was called a man after God's own heart? Because he was a worshiper. David was the only worshiping king in the Old Testament. I, this is not true, but it's not this drastic, but I'm going to say it. Maybe it'll make an impression on you. He invented worship. He invented praise. I mean, there was no praise and worship before David came along. People didn't do that in the temple. The temple's the Old Testament, man. Sacrifices and, and uck and all, yeah, yeah. the law and all that kind of stuff. So David, on his way out of the city, sad because he's losing his church and he can't go into the presence of God anymore, says, uh, wait a minute. You know, I used to get my harp when I was with those sheep. And I used to just sing and praise and and it just lifted my spirit, and man, it felt like God was there. Somebody, hey, we do have my harp, don't we? Yeah, well, you got my harp? The harp, that, that string thing. Yeah. All right, make sure we got it, because I'm going to need it here in a few minutes. And when he got where he was going, he probably got that harp out, and he went over somewhere by himself, and he began to strum on that harp, and he began to, and he began to sing, he began to remember and reflect on things, and 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 and... and and he begins to worship because he is a personal worshiper and he, he's lamenting the fact that he's not going to get to go to the temple anymore. But here's the truth. He understands, look, I don't have to go to the temple to be in the presence of God. I can go into the presence of God anywhere I am. So the devil's got me beat down and crying about not going to the temple when the truth is, wherever I am, 
God is there. For I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's what David, go quickly to God. Look, you need to come to church, and I've, I've had several messages that told you why. Protection, safety, all kinds of things, you're benefited by being together, but sometimes you can't be with everybody. You gotta go it alone. And if, you'll, and if you'll go to God, he's with you wherever you are. You are never at a loss. The enemy is always at a loss and you are never alone. Now, the only thing I would ask you to do with a message like this is to reflect on, and I think you need to do this on every message. If you ask me, say, Pastor, how do I need to receive a message? What do I need to do with it? Here, here's what I think. I, I think you need... In, in every message, you need to personalize it. And by personalize it, I mean you need to say, what is this saying to me? What is God wanting me to hear? What is it that God is sharing with me? Because that's what a message is. I mean, I, I guarantee you, I, I'm a messenger. <laughs> I don't decide a lot. And y'all know that. Uh, so what is God saying to me? Because God's trying to help us, y'all. You know, I mean, he, he loves us. He doesn't want us to be taken advantage of. He doesn't want us to be hurt. And I'm telling you, we are living in the most wicked, evil times that you have ever seen. And I, I'm not, I don't have a lot of hope for it, actually. I mean, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer or something, but I, I, I mean, I, I don't see it getting better. I see it getting worse. And that's why God's saying these things to us. He wants us to be ready. Now, I'm not saying the world's ending tomorrow. Don't get all down. Quit listening to your soul, all right? He's trying to make you upset. But I'm just saying be ready. If it's another 100 years, great. All right, we'd be ready. That's all it boils down to. If it's tomorrow, come on, Jesus, I'm ready. All right, stand your feet. Please.